Welcome to Smart Muslimer podcast. Inshallah, if you find this podcast episode useful, please subscribe and tell your friends and family about Smart Muslimer. Also, good news, I have a newsletter and that's how we can stay in touch. To subscribe, please go to smartmuslimer.com. Details are also in the podcast notes. In the newsletter, I'll be sharing my book recommendations, productivity tips, and online courses that I've created, and also information about a new book that I'm writing called Smart Single Muslimer. Inshallah, it will help you to transform the way you approach love and relationships. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to the podcast. My name is Farhat Amin. Today I'm speaking to Bint Yasin to explore the issues around single, that Muslim, single Muslims face in their search for a suitable spouse. Now, Sister Bint Yasin, she's a 25 year old sister from Australia. Um, she's single at the moment and she's been, um, she's active in her local Muslim community and has had her fair share of experiences when it comes to marriage including personal experience, such as acting as a kind of pseudo matchmaker in the community and, uh, and to her close friends. And um, she has, and some of her close friends have recently, alhamdulillah, got married. So, you know, and they've been through the whole process. So, alhamdulillah, she's going to be giving her input and, um, and inshallah advice as well to single sisters when, you know, that how should they navigate this um, in a kind of matrix of marriage that you know they seem to be in and want to, want to find out how do really how do you find um uh you know a good islamically minded um spouse in in this day and age and, and i think this is particularly relevant for um young muslim women living in uk australia america you know and many non-muslim countries because i think it uh, from what i'm seeing it's it's become a little bit more difficult than it was back in my day um, so, Assalamu alaikum, Binti Haseen. Like, what's the, um, how are you going? Alhamdulillah, I'm very well. How are you? What time is it in Australia? Alhamdulillah. It's uh, around 5 a.m., so just around Fajr time here. Okay. Uh, so, I was here for, you know, taking the time to, to come on. Um, because it's interesting that this is, um, this is a subject that I've wanted to speak to sisters about for a while, but some uh, people are generally shy to talk about it. Um, and I cannot totally understand why. However, I think, um, you know, okay, I'm married, so I, my perspective is very different now. And I think that when I, the younger sisters and the single sisters that I know, they would really like to hear from a sister like yourself, inshallah. So let's begin with, what do you see as, you know, when you look at the marriage scene at the moment, what are the difficulties um, and also the eases that people have, you know, in getting married. Yep. Yeah, um, well, first of all, I'd like to thank you as well for having me onto the podcast. It's my first time as a guest on the podcast, so it's a great opportunity. So thank you for that. Um, now, in terms of marriage, uh, before we get into this whole discussion, um, obviously I'm speaking from the perspective of someone who is single at the moment. So um, I would be mainly focusing on the difficulties that I'm encountering or people are encountering, but you know, we have to realize that any with any situation, ease and difficulty is from Allah alone. So you have people that, for, for them, getting married has been a very smooth process. Like there's people who, the first person that they consider, then it works out and they get married, alhamdulillah. And then there's other people who've been considering people for years and have went through multiple um, suitors, but it just uh, hasn't worked out. So... That's from Allah alone, and only Allah knows why. Perhaps there's a test for a particular sister who's going through multiple um, tries, and you know there's a test, and there's wisdom in everything. Uh, and we can only speculate. But the whole intention for our current discussion would be more so that let's try seeing if there's any issues that we may be responsible for, and doing our part in tying our camel, so fulfilling our responsibility when it comes to um, making this process easier and uh, as close to uh, the Islamic ideals as possible. 
So there is a good uh, hadith about trusting in Allah, but also tying your camel, where Anas ibn Malik reported that a man said, uh, O Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, should I tie my camel and trust in Allah, or should I leave her untied and trust in Allah? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, tie her and trust in Allah. So just as we trust in Allah in everything that happens to us, we should also do our part and tie our camel as well. So that is, inshallah, the purpose of um, the discussion today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's brilliant because we we have to make it up in anything that we want generally in life, whether it's, uh, I'm just going to take the example of the job. We don't just sit at home and wait for the job to land in our lap. We do something, we prepare, we study, we, you know, we find out what is it that I need to do. And I think, you know, and as Muslims, we're not lazy. We, um, so it's our mental, how we view this and the mindset we bring to the whole issue of marriage. Um, is I think that's, if anyone, you know, is thinking, if they're in that situ the situation, we're thinking, I really want to get married, but I don't know what to do. And oh, it's just not happening. Um, I think this is a podcast to listen to and, and to really think practically, inshallah. Um, so what would you say is... Um, one of, you know, there are many factors when looking to get married. You know, there are massive books written on it. I, I remember reading loads of them. And um, I'd like to begin with, uh, when it comes to standards, but, um, uh, as far as what, uh, what young women are looking for nowadays, what would you say about the standards that people have? Well, I think with any decision that we make, a lot of our self-perception uh, and how what we believe to be our, uh, how we see ourselves and um, the sort of trajectories we're on, that would play a big role in how we would want to view a potential suitor as well. So if we perceive ourselves to be uh, quite practicing or, uh, you know, geared to uh, certain interests or um, certain inclinations, we'd want someone who's similar minded, right? And that's pretty natural. But then we also have to realize that we're not living in a vacuum. So there are influences all around us and they may influence in ways that we may or may not uh, recognize. So um, generally, uh, we've been thinking that movies and um, entertainment, that sort of stuff has had an influence, which it definitely has. But I think now the times are generally changing to be more social media orientated. So like, like 10 years ago, there was mainly like, I don't know, people on Facebook, or they were on like one or two different platforms. Um, and what they would share as well would differ from today. So today you have like multiple platforms and everyone is generally across all, all of them. And then you have people that share everything like they share every small thing of their personal lives and even if we may even if we're not um we're not like it's not something that we do or it's not something that we look upon highly but we do have to realize that that does have an influence on us so when we see people sharing um you know they give us an insight into their personal lives with their husbands and every small detail then we naturally want um something like that as well like if that's something that's coming in and we're consuming that so that does have an influence on us. So I think our standards are influenced by our own self-perception of who we are. Uh, and then along with that, um, the things that we consume from our environment, whether that's social media or the ideas that we are um, subjected to in our communities, and then also our experiences. So as we get older, we see, um, we see, we see around us people going through the process and what uh, works for them, what doesn't work for them. And that also influences what we would uh, want when we would consider someone as well. Yeah, so so yeah, our, our, what we're consuming is shaping what our standards are like. I saw a, re a short video recently. Um, it, was a, uh, it, was, it was on the wedding day and you don't see the bride because she's a, she wears hijab, but it's got the husband and it's, um, and the, the thing was, uh, my husband's reaction when he first saw me without hijab something like that and mm -hmm. uh, now the thing is and it was really sweet uh, when i saw it i thought oh, this is quite sweet and he was really nervous and then he turns around and he sees her you don't see the girl but then he's like really happy and she's coming downstairs and then it stops now then i now i straight away i thought because I've been, i'm thinking about all of this for the podcast i thought now a single girl watching that she's gonna want that she's gonna think oh that's so sweet that's so lovely and 
But what if she doesn't get that? Definitely, you know, yeah. and, and she's going to be thinking, and also, okay, Marshall, you look very handsome. Again, I was thinking, well, there you go. That's another picture of, oh, well, my husband, he, he's got to look like that. And I want to have that fairy tale on my wedding day. But not everyone's going to get that. Um, exactly, yeah. And, you know, it's I think that what you just said, that is just so sad because what um you know i do this with my students um i'm always giving them my, my i teach english online and, and nowadays i'm just giving them articles about social media and i get them to analyze them and, and then because i'm trying to do some kind of dower to them um and to get them to think but um the, the, with, when it comes to husband and wives and couples most of this stuff is we don't how do we know it's even true you know it's as far as you know this stuff is staged that's nothing that people um you know this the i was speaking again i saw this terrible terrible video about uh, a couple their dancer hijabi and, and beard guy both dancing tiktok video and i thought is that what people then want uh, is that a mm -hmm. thing that if i'm not doing that with my husband at home there's something mm -hmm. wrong <laughs> and I, I was thinking things are really you know um the expectations uh, are are very unrealistic no no one does that normally definitely yeah um but i think people know people know that social media is deceptive but then right. subconsciously these things are still playing an influence on us like yeah you, many people know of like people that post uh things of their personal lives or behind the scenes when they know them personally they know that things aren't as you know nice and fairy tale like but then at the same time, like you just, you, you might know something, but then it still has an influence on you. Hmm. So, so would you say, cause I'm really coming to this conclusion and I've started doing this in my own life where I'm um, drastically reducing my social, the, how long I'm on social media meetups. Like, have you seen that, um, the Netflix program, um, documentary, um, the social, the social dilemma? Mm, no, I haven't seen it yet. I yeah. Oh, that. yeah. You definitely should watch it, and because then I'm and the books that I'm reading, I'm reading one of the ten arguments to delete your social media accounts. Um, and it's again, it all gears towards this: the idea of it's um, it, it's making us unhappy. And so, when it comes to marriage, if you're, if like you said, if that's what you're consuming you're building this picture up of, of a marriage that it, it isn't realistic and it doesn't exist and, it, and online it's fake ultimately um so okay we've got this you know kind of the, the social media expectations of marriage um what about um you know family and you know um, within the muslim community the expectations that are there do you think what, what would you say about them well i think um parents and families definitely have expectations um, and generally they tend to be high which is natural because parents and families want what is best for their children and they want to ensure that they go into a big life decision with security and confidence so oftentimes they want them they want the potential suitor to be of a decent financial status they often want someone from the same culture especially for immigrant parents because uh, that's something they're familiar with and they can gauge what sort of person they are uh, based on that as well um, now again like the the more uh, we have our own standards and then parents and families have their own standards and as you uh, keep on adding on the standards the more and more uh, narrow that pool of potentials gets so mm. i think generally parents are recognizing that it's not fair for for example them to only consider people from a certain bracket of how much they earn or what culture they're from because like i said that just very narrows it down and then on top of that if you want someone who's practicing so that mix is quite difficult to find someone who's practicing earns decently well has a good job same culture than someone that um you know his personality or uh inclinations match with yours like it's you'd be very lucky to find someone who ticks all yeah. those boxes yeah so and parents yeah no carry on yeah yeah, parents are generally i think they are easing up um after being especially people that have been here for longer they can they can recognize how difficult it is to get married um but then again like it, there's still so many parents and we hear about this all the time that they just have these very narrow uh standards for their children and children are getting frustrated but then they also don't know how to go about that so some people just rebel and go ahead and pursue their interests and then other people 
uh, seeing that as, okay, we need to uh, obey our parents. We, uh, the Islam places such a high emphasis on obeying your parents. So then they see that as a, um, as a form of worship, then like, okay, that's it. Our parents have not allowed us to look into these prospects. Then as much as that um, is, you know, really, really making it difficult for me, I'm just going to um, be quiet and not say anything about it, which I think is another extreme. Like there mm. needs to be um, open dialogue and, you need to discuss these things with your parents and show them like it's not that easy to get married with all of these standards there as well. Yeah, I know. I don't, I think silence actually isn't an option because I know people who did that and they, they're now they're in their forties and they're, then they're not married. And unfortunately they're, uh, they're just not going to get married now because, um, and if they had said something, the ones that I know that said something because you right, a, a, alhamdulillah, our parents who, they had certain ideas, that's the way it was done back home. And so they came here and they brought those ideas and that's fine. So no one's criticizing for that. But if their ideas are un-Islamic, then there is a problem. And if you're, you know, you're not allowed to say, reject someone who comes to your home who is suitable um, based on just, he just hasn't got enough money or he isn't the same caste as us, which caste in Islam is, is haram anyway, that doesn't exist. And, um, and I think we do have to, I think one thing that we, we can do to help this, like whether, like we're going to be the future, you know, well, some of us parents who've got older kids, so we shouldn't do that. You know, it's easy to say, oh, that's very bad and we should do it, but we go there, then go and do it. A couple of years later, we're just as picky and mm -hmm. annoying. Um, so we have to start changing our thinking as far as our kids so you know we have to stop this cultural you know this racism that exists that not allowing kids pakistanis don't allow their kids to marry black muslims you know where does that come Definitely. from Definitely. you know so it has to the thing is just talking um the talking about it is good and then we have to do something you know just like we said well, a sister or why they want to get married he has to do something where you know we also i'm also thinking in our families we have younger brothers and sisters you know, young let's say if i i don't have any younger sister but if i did and she wants to get married and my parents are being unreasonable it, i should step in and talk to my parents and say look this isn't fair you can't just say oh no i don't want to get into trouble i don't want to walk the boat you know we have to because this is when i see the unhappiness that sisters who want to get married but they're because of what their parent the unreasonableness of their parents um you know what they're saying they haven't got married. that's you know that's really oppressive you know they're not going to get married they're not going to have kids um and it is it's it's very sad because what you said about that there's this what you said about the the you know the idea oh no we have to stay quiet and obedient yes we should we should be obedient but um not to the point where we're just allowing this to continue um uh but in charlotte it's um but again, it's, um, I think the good thing, Ahamda, there is hope. Don't, don't you find the fact that there is hope? Like, have you noticed that maybe some cultural, like the, the race issue is starting to break down a little bit? I'm seeing more mixed couples now. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I do think that parents are recognizing that it's unfair and they are being more open. And yeah, there are definitely much more um, intercultural marriages, Alhamdulillah. Mm -hmm. Do you think that sisters who are, you know, so like, practicing us in they don't wear, wear so much look i'm not criticizing sisters do wear makeup but you know you know once you decide okay i want to wear hijab and you know i'm not gonna wear so much makeup i'm not gonna socialize with boys anymore um do you think they face um particular difficulties i think they do definitely um the way our communities are unfortunately they're not always the most um islamic minded even the even the most religious communities you find they do place an emphasis on physical appearance of sisters and how a sister presents herself now we should obviously of course be presentable but if if all that a sister is just judged upon is her looks and how well she dresses up and how um good she looks and that those are the ones that um like people give recommendations to and they try to match their sons up with in the community then that makes it quite difficult for those who are uh, more practicing and who try to uh who try to stay away from that sort of stuff like I, I remember someone on a platform saying that oh like i you know i don't wear much makeup i don't interact with boys 
um, as in socially, I don't really um, hang out with them or uh, have them in my close friend circle. And unfortunately, I've never had, you know, aunties from the community come to me and say like, oh, are you looking to get married? I know someone like it's always uh, the other sisters who are uh, much more um, dressed up or uh, mm. well presented. So like, I don't know, it's, it's unfortunate because you'd want as a spouse, I would imagine practicing brothers would want practicing sisters who value their deen and put that as a priority. Um, but the way that our community is, um, especially if brothers aren't being uh, proactive in who they want to pursue, then the elders in our community, which um, often do still have a strong remnants of culture in their attitude, they're going to place preference on um, people that perhaps uh, may not be exactly how practicing sisters are yeah so they don't they don't want the plain modest looking sister they want uh the, what women that that's yeah i know i i do think that that's um i've, I've heard that as well and i've seen it and um i guess you know people do need to think we like again it's back to that there's the hadith isn't there that what should you know, you can marry, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, you know, but the four reasons why you marry a woman. So it can be for her, her beauty, for her wealth, for her lineage, or her deen. And the Prophet said, said, go for the deen, you know, because that's the thing, ultimately, that's what matters. Um, and yeah, but this is, this is the, you know, kind of topsy-turvy world we're living in now, where, you know, what shines brightest gets the most attention. Um, Definitely. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's but alhamdulillah. I think th th this is the thing though. This women, you know, should shouldn't lose hope that if because you know it's better to not get married than to get married. You know, than to think because what's the alternative? What take off our hijabs, start putting on makeup. You know, be someone you're not. Um, it, like, what is what do you have to do to get a guy? And what kind of guy is he going to then be? Definitely. Um, uh, but um, but okay, yeah. Speaking about Muslim men, then, and alhamdulillah, we're not we're not bashing men at all. But um, I've heard this that um, complaint from from women that there aren't decent guys out there. As in, one okay, like they only want um, women who who look be you know um, stereotypically beautiful, um, or they don't um, they don't want to commit. You know, they don't want the responsibility. They, and so what do you think again um what what have you what, in your experience when it comes to um muslim men as far as you know wanting to get married you know what 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 do you what have you noticed um yeah like you said that this isn't us trying to say like oh all guys are just really bad and there's just no one left there are alhamdulillah plenty of good uh, decent upright brothers even in my own family and community I wouldn't describe any of them to be um, you know not decent they are you know good religious people but we also have to realize that the way our society uh, raises men and women is different so how our immigrant parents or how the immigrant parents have generally tended to raise boys has been with uh, less um, responsibility, they're given more freedoms and little expectations when it comes to uh, developing family oriented individuals. Um, and that's the opposite with females, like they're raised to be uh, much more, they're often much more controlled and they have um, less freedoms to, I wouldn't say mess up, but like their more emphasis is placed on them uh, being more nurturing and responsible, whereas with uh, men, it's often, uh, a lot a lot more things are allowed to slide and they're given more freedoms and then if things uh, if a person for instance isn't decent then it's that society uh, it's that community expectation saying oh they're just boys and then they eventually mature up later on when they're given the responsibility which is not something that a potential sister would really want to consider they wouldn't want to marry potential um, mm. but that's the way our society they're much more forgiving when it comes to men um, instead of uh, women um, and I think if you if you speak to brothers, I think they'll say a similar thing where they would say, oh, I just don't think there is um, good sisters left in the mm. community. Um, and it's hard to it's hard to identify what like what the actual case is. But from my um, this is just me speculating, but I think often women growing up in 
um, whether it's the UK or Australia or America, they're often frustrated at how our communities have raised men. Um, and they see people, they see men in our own, like the wider community, and they're often much more caring when it comes to uh, relationships, right? So we get frustrated at how men are in our community. And then a lot of times these sisters then, um, based on their negative experiences, then they tend to be more, I wouldn't say feminist orientated, but they, <laughs> they place a stronger emphasis on like uh, their rights and they're often raging as well um, with the men in that community. So then men don't like, I think they're just afraid of like the feminist word, right? So then they just, they don't want anything to do with it. And they see it as like a, um, as a trend in the community. Like, oh, these, like the, the women today are just very much, they're all, they're all a bunch of feminists and they're not people that we want as a spouse. But I think it's a, a two-sided coin, like the men, the way that they've been uh, cultured. And then I think our response, females response to that, um, both has a role to play. Mm, yeah, I know it's definitely more nuanced in that um, there, there were uh, issues there and it's easier. The easy option is to just label the genders, to label each other and attack and have a go. But, it, it, and the, but the problem is still there then. People, people still want to get married. They still want to have relationships. Um, and um, it's interesting that, um, you know, I, I'm thinking... Uh, as far as the Asian kind of Pakistani community, I know there's a tendency for them, for the mothers, not everyone, but um, there's a, um, a tendency that the, everything is done for the, for the son. And so they're not taught to, for example, whether it's use, know how to use the washing machine or wash any dishes, just even, just to be able to take care of themselves, like they're, they're taken care of too much. Um, and the thing is that that's not, as a mother, that's not a good thing to do to your child. You need to, that you need to give them practical skills. And although, yes, uh, uh, the role of the wife is to take care of the home. No one's arguing that. But what if, what if even just for your son, if he goes and lives alone at university, he needs to know how to take care of himself. Just for, um, and then when he would get married, he would then really appreciate that now he's got a wife who's now helping him with that. But mm -hmm. if you're if 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 a guy's just used to his mum doing everything for him, he's then going to expect his wife to do everything for him. Um, definitely, definitely. And I think, like you said, that the role of the wife is to take care of the home, but at the same time, the man also has to have a responsibility towards his home. Like he can't, mm -hmm. he can't be an absent figure. Um, and I see people in my own community raising their children now. Um, like one particular person that comes to mind, uh, she's raising her daughter to do everything around the house, and they're like mm -hmm. teenagers. And then her son, like, it's not like he has many responsibilities that like, he can't do anything. He's just playing video games. But yeah. then the mom's ironing his shirt and he, she doesn't get him to do much. And there's not that expectation. And as long as he's quiet, he's perceived to be a good child. And then if the daughter gets angry at that, then she's seen to be a rebel and, oh, like, mm. you're just going against what um, the role of a female is. And I think mm. that's just very detrimental to how these two individuals will grow up and then how they perceive how they've been uh, cultured and then how they'd want to, I think they'd eventually like to rebel against how they've been cultured and then often label that as Islamic. Yeah, this is the, this is it. That, um, and that isn't Islamic. That, that's, um, and so, yeah, I, I think this is all less things that we need to think about, that how are we, you know, when in the future you have children that thinking, how am I going to raise them? You know, have I found out how the Prophet Sallallahu raised his, his kids? Um, I think that's the approach rather than taking it just from culture or thinking, no, everything's going to have to be completely equal. Again, we have to sit down and think about that um, because the, um, you know, if you, if we want to have a healthy attitude towards, you know, healthy Islamic attitudes towards marriage, um, it, it doesn't just suddenly, it doesn't come from nowhere. It comes from our upbringing. Um, and Absolutely. so with, um, Okay, let's move on to, okay, what advice, so, um, you know, this is, this is something that's happen is happening a lot now. Um, young girls, out of frustration, or even, or, or for whatever reasons, I don't, there could be other reasons, they are turning to thinking, okay, um, if I want to find a decent guy, I need to, um, I have to either go to, either everyone else is dating, and I need to get, how am I going to find out if the person I want to marry is, 
compatible you know that um should i you know they're turning to muslim you know kind of muslim apps um dating apps or or one like i was speaking to um some teenagers i know and they were saying social well not teenagers they're kind of 20 somethings at university and they were saying that people go on twitter people go on um again social media to find um they'll think they'll follow people and then they can't dm them and they'll say oh no my intention is to um is to get married um, but you know, this is the only way I can do it. And so I'm going to do, I'm not going to do anything haram. I'm not going to meet up with them, but they'll be chatting to them for ages. Um, it's like they're basically the dating online. Um, mm-hmm. but, but they see the alternative is that, Oh, I'll have to marry some of my parents or someone from back home or someone, I don't want an arranged marriage. That, that's basically it. That's the bottom line. I want, I want to get to know them. I want to fall in love with them. Maybe not do anything physical with them, but that seems to be the picture that I'm it is being painted that that's what Muslim kids should do and can do. Mm-hmm. Well, I think anything like if you if you do anything that is um, contradictory to what Islam has outlined, then you're going to run into tro- uh, prob- problems and troubles. If you're going to if you're going to pursue something in an un-Islamic way, then there's not going to be any barakah in it, and it's only going to um, it's only going to get you in more. Um, yeah it's not going to be a good that's not how you would enter a major life decision um so i think there are plenty of ways um that you can approach this topic of marriage and um, make efforts in getting married so traditionally how um how it work is that generally people in the community would recommend potential suitors to the parents and the parents would look into those but if that's not uh, working then what you what the sisters need to do is they do need to be more proactive um, and they can't be a hermit. They can't just be sitting at home waiting for someone to knock on their door and just get married like that. They need to uh, make it known um, in their networks that that they are um, open to suggestions. And again, you don't have to do this in a very uh, direct way. Like you don't have to tell everyone or write in a thread, guys, I'm looking to get married, help me. It, it can it bring it up in conversations like, uh, when you're speaking to your friends who are married they they may know their husbands may know um of someone or um in, just generally in your society make it known that you are looking uh and you are open to suggestions and unfortunately our society seems to be um they they some they for some reason look down upon women uh taking initiative uh like i i don't especially if you're doing it in an islamic way i don't know why uh, they would do. They would look down upon that, especially since um, Khadija radiallahu anha also um, she didn't directly approach the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but she went through a friend and expressed interest, and then uh, th- that friend passed it on to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in a indirect way. So there are definitely ways to um, go about it where you can be more proactive, but you don't have to be uh, very direct. Um, and I think our brothers and our fathers and other male figures in our lives should also um, make some sort of an effort instead of just relying on um, like aunties uh, recommending to each other because our, these are our brothers and our fathers are the ones who are interacting with uh, potential brothers we could possibly consider in the mosques or um, their own personal contacts or people they would know, um, people that they've spent time with and they know how they are as uh, individuals. So I think that's um, definitely something that sisters should look into. Uh, when it comes to apps, I don't think I, they, they, are, they definitely have their pros and cons. Um, and it really depends on how you use it. So if you're just using it to um, chat to potentials with no real intention to uh, take it anywhere, then I don't think that's going to really help you. Um, but you, I, ha- I know people that have used these apps and have uh, found uh, successful that there have been successful matches um, and I think it's useful because these apps allow you to filter and narrow your search so for example if everyone that's being suggested to you through your contacts if you're looking for someone who's practicing and everyone who's being suggested to you doesn't even hasn't even ticked the box of regular prayers then that's an issue. So you can use these apps, which often have like filters, especially when it comes to these Muslim apps have filters when it comes to religious levels as well. So for instance, um, if you're looking for someone who always prays, you can select that, right? And then your suggestions or the suggestion the app would give you would um, have that basic criteria met. So in in a sense, they are efficient. 
Um, but again, it just really depends on how you approach it. Like if you're, uh, if you're going to use that app to link up with potentials and then directly take that to your family, I think that would be the ideal way. But if you're just using it to, like you said, online dating, mm -hmm. um, then I, I don't know. I don't think that's very productive. Yeah. It, you, but Hamlet, so then what about the, how do you then get to know someone before you get married to them? What's the halal way of doing that? Um, so I think, again, like as a spectrum, like you, the, the, the middle way is the best way. So there's people that, and I think religiously people have this impression that if you, uh, if you have like a, an Islamic marriage, you just meet the guy once or twice and that's it. Um, and then a lot of times people aren't satisfied with that. And then that's when they decide to do things their own way. Right. So I think a good way um, to get to know someone is if, if you need to make it clear that this is for the, this is for the intention of marriage. Right. So this is not just to um, like have a relationship without marriage. Right. So once both parties are clear that this is for the purposes of marriage, the parents are both on board as well. Both sides, parents are, um, aware that these two individuals are um, considering marriage, then I think the best way to get to know each other is uh, spending time with third parties in like family situations um, and just interacting normally as if you have like you have, we normally have like family dinners and events. So if there are two individuals that are looking to get married, I think families should make it um, they should be inviting and create an environment where these individuals can get to know each other with um, other people present. So never mm -hmm. alone, yeah. um, but within um, a wider setting. And I think parents, again, like parents, there are some parents that think that, nope, the guy and girl should not interact. And that what, what that often happens is then these individuals, because they want to know each other before they enter into such a big life decision, they decide to uh, get to know each other, but behind um, everyone, like no one knows yeah. about it or it's mm. uh, through online just between them two or they're meeting up without um, the parents knowing. So I think definitely meeting without parental um, knowledge or a third party is definitely not the way to go. Um, so I think the best thing to do is get to know each other in settings with other people present as well and just interact normally, just get a, get a feel of how their personality is, what sort of um, how they are as a person. And then when, when they are, both of them are satisfied with how they are as a person, then I think there's no point in delaying it then. Like if you are satisfied, you've gotten to know each other, you're happy with the sort of trajectories both of you are on, then I think it's best to go ahead and um, get married or at least have the nikah, if not the full marriage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think what you've outlined really does show that there are there are ways you, if you want to find if you want to do it islamically you want barakah in your marriage you, there is a, there are ways to do it you don't have to go down the dating route that that isn't the only option just because that's what is being pushed to us all the time and through the movies through the songs like somehow if you don't okay they for non-muslims it's got they're fine just, you know you, sleep, you need to sleep with them to to know if you want to be with them and and for them, even getting married isn't, it's, isn't a big deal. Get married, don't get married. They don't mind. They, you know, they've got many, they have many paths. But we only have one path. And, um, and so it's, um, yeah, it, if we make an effort, you know, there was a really nice, um, I went to a khutbah and um, the khutib, the imam of the mosque, uh, at the end, he announced that we're going to be having our monthly tea tea party and I thought oh this sounds interesting and he said so, and he said I want you to all come and bring your families bring your sons and daughters who are marriageable age and he goes and this is an opportunity for you to find husbands and wives for your children and he said and I thought it was so good that the mosque was organizing that and he said you know you'll be able to see each other the parents will be there you can talk to each other the parents can talk to each other um he didn't say that the guys and the girls can talk to each other yet but he goes how else he, are we going to get our children married? And I do think um, if mosques aren't doing that, they should be doing it because that will keep it, you know, when we're so quick to say it, how bad Muslim teenagers are and the Muslim youth are going to, you know, hell in a, you know, in a car and they, we're really quick to, but how many solutions are we giving and alternatives are we creating for them? Um, definitely, definitely. I think that's such a beautiful way to do it.
Mm -hmm. It's uh -huh, it was so simple. The mosques are so big, you know, and they always have tables and chairs. You know, <laughs> they've got everything. They've kept a lot of them have kitchens. Um, okay, so let's round it up then. Um, what advice? What parting advice would you give to um, single women who are who want to get married? Uh, so I think the best way to end this would be um, with the hadith. Um, mm -hmm. So I'll just read this hadith, which I think every time I think of marriage and I, for some people that might be having a difficult time, this hadith comes to mind. Uh, on the authority of Abu Abbas, Abdullah ibn Abbas, um, uh, who said, one day I was behind the Prophet وسلم, riding on the same mount and he said, oh young man, I shall teach you some words of advice. Be mindful of Allah and Allah will protect you. Be mindful of Allah and you will find him in front of you. If you ask, then ask Allah alone. If you seek help, then seek help from Allah alone. And know that if the nation were to gather together to benefit you with anything, they would not benefit you except with what Allah had already prescribed for you. And if they were to gather together to harm you with anything, they would not harm you except with what Allah had already prescribed against you. The pens have been lifted and the pages have been dried. Uh, and this is hadith number 19 from the 40 um, a hadith of Imam al Nawawi. And I think it's this just pretty much sums it up like if you like we're going to put in our effort everything that we talked about today let's say someone does that and um we're going to take on board all that advice and let's say it's still not there's there's no success you haven't found anyone think about it like if everyone like let's say your whole community got together and they tried to uh find you a, a potential spouse and they um had like brainstorm meetings and they really went all out know that if it's not written for you if allah has not destined that for you it's not going to happen and on the flip side if there is no one helping you right and you are only um trusting allah and you are only doing what you can you don't need anyone if allah has written someone for you who will come to you without anyone's help so i think that's such a good way to um put things into perspective that at the end of the day your risk is from allah alone and you can't get it quicker or you can't slow it down with anything apart from dua so i think the only thing that you can do is put in your effort and make dua yeah the power of dua can can never be underestimated and i think also that we should you know shaitan will whisper to us and say you know why don't you you know if you just put on tighter clothes if you're just going to show your figure a bit more show a bit of hair under your hijab, you know, that will get attention, that'll get some guy's attention. And I've, I've actually heard, you know what, it's really sad. This is, I know someone who she's um, divorced and she was literally crying one day. I, and she, I said to her, what's wrong? And she said, I'm, she goes, my friends, her other friends, she goes, they're sending me messages telling me I'm so frumpy and, and I look so, you know, where you wear your jill barb is just like, you're, you're not very fashionable. And she goes, they're saying to me, I'm never going to get find a husband looking the way I do and that you need to smarten up. And she, and she showed me on her phone, they'd sent her photos of basically what I said, that tighter clothing, hair, loads of makeup. And they said, this is what you need to do to get a man. I, I just met, and I, I'm not saying to her, don't, don't, you need to delete these girls. Who are, you, who are they? They're not your friends. And alhamdulillah, she didn't, but it was, it, it isn't, it's upsetting and it's hard. No one's underestimating that, but that we do if we rely on Allah inshallah if Allah wants us to find a good um you know Islamically minded caring kind God-fearing husband then Allah will give us that if that's what we are do dwell for inshallah um but um Jazakallah khair uh it was really nice speaking to you um and um inshallah hopefully we'll you know you'll come on again inshallah in the near future maybe you could talk it'd be interesting to, to know about what it's like for Muslims in Australia um, you don't, I don't really hear much about Muslims in Australia. Um, are there, are there many? Is it a large community in, in, um, in Australia? There's, there's a decent amount. Uh, I think we're around 2% of the population. Oh, okay. Um, most of that's concentrated in around Sydney and Melbourne. So yeah, we're in our own little bubble. We're just observing <laughs> what's happening in the UK and US. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. That's very true. Uh, okay then, so that's like it. Take care and we will speak again soon. Asalaamu Alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. This episode is brought to you by farhatamin.com, a website that specializes in 
Islamic stickers, Muslim activity books, as well as Ramadan and e decorations. Wholesale and reseller inquiries are also welcome. So visit farhatamin.com today.